Good Wednesday morning. Obviously, the theme continues uh, with John's reading. I'll do, I'm going to skip parts of it, okay? But I'm just going to break it out, okay? He said, Beloved, if God so loved us, we must we must love one another. And I tell you that already. No one has ever seen God. Yet if we love one another, God remains in us. See, that's the intimacy of communion. And his love is brought to perfection. That's the intimacy of communion. See, if we love one another, God remains in us. And his love is brought to perfection in us. You see? God is love. I skipped a couple of lines. God is love. And whoever remains in love remains in God and God in him. And this is love brought to perfection among us that we have confidence in the day of judgment because as he is, so are we in this world. There is no fear in love. Boy, I love this section here. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. And so one who fears is not yet perfect in love. Boy, that is so, so important. Let me draw a contrast with that, okay? Because the, you got to be old for this one, okay? You really do have to be old for this, but those of us who grew up in the 50s, who are now in the 70s and 80s, okay? We were brought up in a, in a religion, in a Christianity of fear. We certainly were. Our confessional practices, our teaching, our moralizing was, I can only say we were, we were, we were, we were really, we, we were preached the gospel of terror, moral terror. There was more mortal sins than you could shake a stick at. There's a powerful resentment I have in that. What a defacing of Christ. The sacrifice of Christ on the cross, reducing it down to Pharisaism. It was pure Pharisaism. Legalism. We had a, it was a culture of fear. When you start throwing around mortal sins like ping pong balls, you're gonna terrify your people. Maybe there was a reason for it, beats me. But that wasn't the gospel of love. And I know when I joined the order that, boy, that was uh, came out of the 50s. I, I was sure God was going to strike everyone dead who got out of line. I mean, it was all that hellish fire and brimstone. And when I joined the order, I began to understand something, again, because I'm a passionist, that the central figure is Christ crucified, who is not a judge, but a lover a lover who gives himself. And it was a certain point I stopped fearing God in that cowardly sense. I have no fear of God at all. In that sense, I fear infidelity on my part, that I will not have been a good, a good son to the Father in Christ. But I have that same fear that I would ever dishonor my own family. It's not a case of fear of punishment. It's a fear of dishonor that I have not lived up to what I've been called to live up to. I have a dread of my own inf my own imperfections, that is, my own failures, not because I'm going to be punished, but because I should have loved better. You see? I should have done better, not because of fear of punishment, but because of the mandate of love itself. I should have loved better. You see? I should have loved better. That's the truth. That is the truth. It's a difference. It's a difference. When you ask yourself, if you're married and you have a family, the question is, were you faithful? What does fidelity mean? Did you love well? Did you love well? Beyond the requirements of fidelity, did you love with a generosity? Did you seek first and foremost the happiness of your beloved? Or did you ask, what's in it for me? Did you ask first what was in it for me, or did you ask what's in, what's in it for him or her? Well, that's the truth. That's the truth. Did you look to get something out of it, or to give something? That's the truth. See? Now, if you're afraid, that means you don't love. You're fearing the punishment. But if you love, the only thing you fear is that your own will not, that you have not loved well, that you just haven't loved well. And that's a good holy fear. <laughs> fear that you have not loved well, not because you're going to be punished, but because you didn't love as well as you could have. Does that make sense? I hope it does.
I think of this at Christmas time, okay? Because I think of this. When you give a gift, you give it because you have to or because you want to make the other person happy. Is it a sacrament of your heart? See? Flowing from your heart because you want so much to tell your beloved, I adore you. And this is a sign of it. I want you to rejoice in it. See? Beauty for beauty. See? Or is it, yeah, I better get her something or I'm going to hear it. You never hear the end of it. If that's the case, well, I hope you never hear the end of it. <laughs> you don't love her. Or you do it in a very, very imperfect way. That's what I'm referring to. Something along that line. Well, very much along that line. See? Christ, Christ does not does, does not elicit fear, but the call of intimacy. I mean, he calls us to love and he sacrifices himself for us. In a sense, he perfect, per, not in the sense, in the truest sense, he models perfect love. He gives but nothing in return, asking nothing in return except love back, that I be loved back, you see. Freely, freely, not because I'm going to fear hellfire, but because I am beautiful, you see? <laughs> you see. Love me because I'm beautiful, because I love you in beauty and goodness and generosity, you see? Not because you're going to burn in hell, you're not going to burn anywhere. Because love is beautiful, and I'm beautiful. I'm thinking like Christ. I am beautiful. Look on me and see that I am beautiful. Love me because I love you, you see? I love you. See? Something about that. And I mean that. That's, if there's a fear, it's a fear, of, fear that we will not live worthily of that love. That we will not love well. That's the truth. I think when we die, we ask, God will ask us, how well did you love those whom I have given you? That's all. How long? Not did you do something wrong, but how well did you love those whom I have given you? See? Isn't that neat? That's not bad, is it? Yeah. Not fear. I don't want you to be afraid. I want you to be intimate with me, but also intimate with those whom I have loved and been loved by. You see? I think that's in the bottom line, the end, what God's going to ask of us. Did you love well those whom I have given you? Or did you not? See? I don't know what the outcome would be if it's not, except I think you got what you loved. It's a frightening thought in many ways. If you chose yourself, you got yourself. If you chose the other, you will be with the other forever. Isn't that right? Yeah. When I think of paradise, I think of paradise as to be loved and be in the presence of the beloved, of those whom I have loved and been loved by, all those whom God has given me in his providential love, the ones he called me to love, you see, the ones who has given me, my family, my friends, all those who are so intimate to my narrative, have I loved them well? See? Not out of fear, except a fear of failure, see, that I will not have loved well. Not that I broke a commandment that I not love well when I could have and should have. See, so I'm stumbling with that. Not the fear of hellfire. Not fear of that at all. I have a fear that I have not loved well enough when I could have and should have and still can. See, I still can. See? Yeah. In many ways, I detest the 50s because of that spirituality of fear to face the beauty of the face of Christ. Christ is beautiful. In his tortured face on the cross, he is beautiful. And in his beauty, in the beauty of his love for us, he makes us beautiful in return, a special kind of beauty, an intimate beauty, an intimate love, and one that embraces all of those whom he has given us to love and be loved by. Yes. It's beauty. It is beauty itself. In the tortured face of Christ, there is pure beauty. And in the love you have for each other, there is the beauty of love itself. If we have any fear, it's to not have loved well enough and not seen the beauty that is there.